On Prayer for the Dead By Elder Cleopa the Romanian From the book Guide to the Orthodox Faith available through our website or Amazon and Kindle After the death of every man, the soul goes to judgment. The judgment of each soul is called personal judgment and is different than the common or universal judgment, which will concern all men at once at the end of the world and after the resurrection of the bodies. This particular judgment investigates the condition of man out of their earthly life and, if this condition is good, the soul is led by angels to happiness, and if it is evil, it is taken by unclean spirits to torment. The happiness to which those found worthy are led is called Abraham's bosom or heaven, and the torment of the unfaithful and sinners are punished to endure is called hell. We see from the words of our Saviour to the thief on the cross, that this judgment and sending of souls to heaven or hell takes place immediately after death. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Or from the words of Apostle Paul when he says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The great Apostle Paul shows us the same thing when he says, For I am torn between, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better, and again, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Among the ancient church writers who speak of the personal judgment, which is different from that of the universal judgment, We mention Tertullian, who says, The soul of the sinner after death, must first face the judgment of God, as one who was the cause of all his actions, but he must also wait for his body to receive the reward for what he has done with the help of the body, which has obeyed his commandments. This must be also known. If during the personal judgment one has been found worthy of torment and punishment, and he is a Christian and a son of the Church of Christ, he has a loophole to escape. Through the living, from the torments to which he has been punished by God. A question for the saint. The possibility of the intervention of the living for the dead is ruled out, knowing that God will judge each one according to their deeds and justice, giving each one the due reward. A judgment based on the intervention of others would no longer be just. Saint Apostle Paul says clearly, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. The response by the saint. What you and those like you think is not true at all. The fact that God will reward each according to their deeds is true. But the fact that the possibility to pray for the dead is excluded is far from the truth. We see in the Holy Scriptures that the prayer of one for another has great value. If what you think is true, the prayer of one for another wouldn't be useful, and the great Apostle Paul would not urge his disciple, Timothy, writing him, I exhort therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks, be made for all men. St. Apostle James says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If our prayers are useful to the living, why wouldn't they be beneficial to the dead, since their souls live and the same God listens to both? To the above testimonies, I will add a few direct testimonies from the Old Testament. Thus, in the second book of Maccabees, it is shown that a sacrifice for the dead soldiers was brought. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Holy Prophet Baruch also says, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, hear now the prayers of the dead Israelites. Remember not the iniquities of our forefathers. The Holy Tradition speaks most clearly of these prayers, starting from the first centuries of the Church, as shown by the content of the Holy Liturgies. St. John Chrysostom shows that the Apostles even ordained a memorial for the dead during the liturgy, saying, Not in vain did the Apostles order that remembrance should be made of the dead in the fearful mysteries. They know that great gain results to them, great benefit, for when the whole congregation stands with uplifted hands, a priestly assembly, and that fearful sacrifice lies displayed, how shall we not prevail with God by our entreaties for them? St. John Chrysostom says that the prayers help only those departed in faith. During the Proscomedi, all who are asleep in the hope of the resurrection and eternal life are commemorated. Thus, we can say that the prayers are useful only to the souls of those who have departed from here, not fully dead, as members of the Church, but having in them a certain faith as the root of the virtues and struggles to develop it into virtues, to those who have performed good deeds as the beginning of the virtues and the weakening of the passions, 
but have not done good so steadfastly, or for so long, as to have attained good habits or virtues to weigh down on the passions. In other words, the prayers are beneficial to those whose powers have not been ruined by serving the passions but have also had a certain habit of good, with which they have when they departed from here. Prayers are useful even to those who have not lived a life of faith and done good deeds, but at the end of life found the strength to repent, but not so deeply yet as to suddenly and entirely transform their being, like the thief on the cross, in which case they would have gone to heaven. A question for the saint. God even condemns those who rely on other people's interventions for their salvation. The Lord said. Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. The response by the saint. In this quotation, cursed and condemned are only those who put their hope of salvation exclusively in the help of men and not in the help of God, from whom they are removed in their hearts, for which they deserve all the condemnation from God and not those who expect from people intercessions for them to God. If that was the case, we would have to consider under this condemnation the great Apostle Paul, who often asks his believers to pray to God for him, as he does for others and hopes for the benefit of these prayers, as we have shown in the teaching on the worship of the saints. So, it is impossible that based on the quote mentioned above to deny the possibility and necessity of praying for the dead, especially since this quote refers to something else. A question for the saint. The prayers for the dead are useless and superfluous, having no result, for the biblical word is clear. Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. Both the great and the small shall die in this land, they shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them, neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning, to comfort them for the dead, neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. The response by the saint. This is only about the sinners who are guilty of heavy sins, which means that for the less sinful dead, the bread can be broken in their remembrance. Thus, from the above quote, it could be understood that the dead should not be buried, and such an unusual practice would not suit you either. A question for the saint. How can one rescue another from hell through remembrance, since it is written? For in death there is no remembrance of thee, in the grave who shall give thee thanks? The response by the saint. Yes, one can be rescued even from hell, but not through the torments of purgatory as the Roman Catholics claim. But through the sacrifice of redemption, which was made for the living and dead. God has the power to rescue the souls from hell, as it is written. I kill, and I make alive, I wound, and I heal. And also, the Lord killeth, and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave, and bringeth up. The power and forgiveness of God, who fulfills anything we ask from him are limitless, and his kindness is so great that only he can change the eternal doom of man. Therefore, the Church prays only to God to rescue the condemned from hell and has faith in His mercy and omnipotence. We know that God asks us to love our fellow men and looks with pleasure to our love. There is no better deed than love, and out of love, we pray for others. The prayer of the Church is all the more heard by God, for in its prayer, the voices of the saints in heaven are intertwined with those of the faithful on earth and with the very voice of the Mother of God. The Church is in endless prayer for its members, angels and apostles, martyrs and patriarchs, and, above all, the Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, pray for all of us, and this holy union is the life of the Church. The Saviour Himself confirms that He will not ignore our prayers, especially when they are made out of love for our fellow men. He says, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Therefore, Prayer for the dead is not only a sign and a union of love but also proof of our faith, for the Saviour also said. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. A question for the saint. Holy Scripture clearly states that there is an insurmountable chasm between hell and heaven, according to the word of the Lord in the parable of the unmerciful rich man and the poor Lazarus. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. If the truth is that you, the Orthodox, can rescue someone out of hell, then how can you cross this impassable abyss and move some of them to the other side, from bad to good? Is it possible? The response by the saint. 
we also teach that an impassable chasm between heaven and hell exists, as the Saviour told us. But this chasm does not have the power to stop our prayers, which we send to God for the dead, and does not make our prayers to God made out of love for our brothers, useless. We do not assume like the Roman Catholics, that purgatory exists. We say that only for those who have mortal unconfessed sins, the passage from hell to heaven is impossible. For those who have lesser sins, this path is not definitively closed, because only at the last judgment will it be decided definitively who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, being self-evident that, after this judgment, one condemned to hell will no longer be able to go to heaven. We know that for those who are guilty of mortal sins, our prayers are useless. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. But this is not the case with the other souls, for whom we pray and must pray. Therefore, the remembrance of the dead is also legitimized by the bond of love, like any prayer. We are fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. By virtue of this citizenship, we pray to Him to forgive our brethren who have passed into the other world. Simeon of Thessalonica comments. The liturgies are more useful to those who are asleep, while the others help them less because by dying, the man ceases to sin, and through sacrifice, they commune with Christ, are filled with joy and divine gift and are delivered from all pain by divine mercy. Therefore, a liturgy must be first performed for them, and then, if they were wealthy, give alms to the poor, help build holy churches and other deeds that are beneficial for their salvation. And it continues. The particles removed from the prospera during the liturgy and the commemorations of the departed unite them with God and commune them with Him unseeingly. Therefore, they comfort both the brothers who have repented and moved to Christ and the holy souls of the saints who rejoice in these remembrances that are made for them, uniting with Christ through the holy liturgy purer and brighter, and by communing more with His gifts, they pray for us. So, for this reason, God made the holy sacrifice and gave it for the salvation and enlightenment of men so that we may all be one with Him, as promised. That is why the saints pray for those who remember them by offering sacrifices in their honor and become intercessors for them, praying that they too may commune with Christ. For this reason, we must commemorate the dead, because love unites the living with the dead and remember the saints, so that, rejoicing, they may also make joyful prayers for us to God. As for the purgatory imagined by Roman Catholics, we have no solid evidence from either Scripture or Holy Tradition. The Holy Tradition shows us only two places clearly. Heaven and Hell. In the Holy Tradition, the Holy Fathers do not recognize purgatory. For example, Great Athanasius, 373, says, It is foolish to believe in the third place in the other life. Venerable Augustine writes, There is no middle ground for someone who is not with Christ to be anywhere but with the devil. We know that the Fifth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople condemned Origen, Didymus the Blind, and Evagrius Ponticus, who taught that future punishments would end. If the Church had any knowledge of the existence of purgatory at that time, it would have made a mention of it as an exception to the eternity of labors, the infinite goodness of God, together with the Eucharistic sacrifice, the prayers of the Church, and the alms given to the poor are sufficient for the salvation of those who have not made in this life the canon of repentance and have not died in the right faith. A question for the saint. But how can the Church's prayers save some from torment before the last judgment? Priest, yes, the Church's prayers can save some after death. The torments suffered by sinners after death before the resurrection of bodies are not final as after the last judgment but temporary, to allow the people of the Church the opportunity to be strengthened in love through prayers for the dead, who can no longer help themselves, but are helped by the love of others. The torments before the last judgment are neither final nor as great as those after the last judgment when they will also be physically endured. A question for the saint. Some say that the saints and angels also pray for those who died in the right faith. How did they understand this? The great Apostle Paul shows us that the Saviour Himself prays for us, and the Spirit also prays for us. To see that the saints also pray for us, check the book of Revelations where it says. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. The saints pray for us and God listens to them. And not only the saints and angels pray for us, 
but there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Dear friends, if you enjoyed this free audiobook, please consider making a donation or joining our Patreon account to hear full books in audio format. Details are in the description. Please pray for us. Sister Christina